morning to worship. I want to say a thank you to um, the families, the Ristos, the Narvisons, and the Ericsons who did the patching of our driveway, which will get us through the, the, next, the next season until we can re resurface the driveway. Um, they still have some little work to do, and so you may come and not be able to drive into the driveway, so just be aware of that. Our Sunday school is beginning today, and the children are downstairs, and I encourage you to look at the bulletin board that they're creating. It's, it's, um, it's just very creative. Jennifer Lang does a wonderful job of creating our bulletin boards for us. Um, and yesterday, we had the privilege of hosting the birthday party for Daryl Bacon, who turns 90 tomorrow. Um, and yeah. <laughs> And uh, uh, we also have a star. You're not 90, or no, okay. your birthday is tomorrow too. So happy birthday! <laughs> Every birthday is a significant birthday. Today we begin our celebration of the season of creation, which is one of my favorite seasons of the church year. <laughs> and for the next five Sundays, we will talk together about all the different ways that the earth is our um, gift giver. Um, and our creator is the one who created it for us um, and alongside of us to care for. So I hope you picked up a ball, uh, and if you didn't, be sure to take one as you go home today. And also I hope you picked up your communion elements there on the back table, um, because we will celebrate communion. So as we prepare to celebrate all that God has given us, through our dear planet Earth, let us join our hearts and spirits in worship. As we light the light of Christ, who was at the beginning of creation, part of the Trinity that breathed life into this planet, who constantly gives us new birth. Thanks for life. You invite us to join in the song. 
I am the blazing star bringing wonder to light. I am the voice of creation praising the God who shapes life. of Genesis 1. In the beginning there was nothing, no up or down, no near or far, no yesterday or tomorrow, only God, here, now. Then came the idea. The idea came from God and was part of God, yet it seemed to have a life of its own. From that very idea all things came to be. Light and darkness, time and space, energy and matter, everything that was needed to make a universe. God gathered them together and set to work. Out of the swirling black gas clouds, fiery stars ignited with a whoosh. Planets and moons stuck, spun together, and galaxies danced like snowflakes on a winter night. It must have been wonderful, dreaming, imagining, making all those things 
that had never been made before. God could see that it was all good. The idea kept growing. On the edge of one galaxy, a sun, whirling around the sun of planets, small, lifeless, covered in dark waters. Nothing special at first. Then the breath of God came like a breeze and ruffled the surface of the waters. And something wonderful happened. Deep in the seas there was life, simple at first, but then more complex. It was if God simply could not get enough of dreaming up new forms of life. They filled the seas, they walked on the land, they flew in the waters. Flowers bloomed and insects buzzed. The little world teemed with life and color and scent and sound. God looked at everything with delight. You know how it is when you make something new. You picture it in your mind, but sometimes your own creation can surprise you. It was all so good, so wonderful. Lovely patterns hidden everywhere. The cleverness of living things who rode on the wind and waves to make their homes in every imaginable place. God enjoyed every bit of it. Day and night, light and dark, land and sea, sky and earth, sun and moon. Maybe God even laughed out loud at the sight of dolphins leaping or birds doing funny dances to attract each other. This is too good to keep to myself, thought God. So God made another kind of living thing one even more like God than all the others. This living thing could love, laugh, delight in beauty, think, imagine, wonder, choose, maybe even have ideas of its own. When God was finished working, it was time to rest, glad to be part of such a wonderful world. The new creation rested too. I loved that interpretation of Genesis 1. I hope that you can take it home and read it more often to get a sense of how God created and earth formed and evolved and became our living planet. So we often forget that these particular, these familiar scriptures that we often read in our Bible have historical context. To us, they are the words we often need for the exact moment we are in when we read them. So we forget sometimes that they were written for a specific time period, for a specific group of people, for a specific purpose. They weren't just dropped from the sky by some divine hand. They were written by actual people for actual people at an actual time in history. And in not remembering that, we lose some of the power and mystery of scriptures. Our passage this morning, which is a very familiar creation account, was written in just such a way. It was written during the time the Israelites were in captivity in Babylon. And in Babylon, like many of the surrounding tribes, the rulers of the land believed that they held all the power both earthly and cosmically. In contrast, the Israelites had lived for generations with the understanding and deep-held belief that there was more to the cosmos than just earthly rulers. They believed that Yahweh was the supreme ruler and shaper of their lives and the world's, world's essence. So in about 500 BCE, while in captivity in Babylon, Israelite scribes wrote this account of the creation story, which has been passed down to them in story for generations. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They wrote these words to help the captive Israels remember that their oppressors were not their only rulers that there was someone much higher than their oppressors who controlled their lives. But this story is not just about power. This is why this story is so important, 
because the story of creation of the earth was not about a creation of a power structure that would rule the earth. This is a beautiful story about relationship, which is so in contrast to most of the stories about rulers. In this creating, God formed a relationship with all of creation, with earth and all of her inhabitants. Because we've heard of our relationship with God, which is a liberating God, since we began our Christian journey, we don't comprehend what this story meant to people in captivity under the rule of harsh and oppressive captors. So I want us to listen to this story now as our forebearers heard it. People who didn't know the earth was round, or even the extent of the cosmos which birthed the earth but who knew somehow that God was on their side. I've given you today a replica of the Earth, our beloved planet, and as we read this narrative, I want you to hold this Earth gently. Imagine her being birthed through the words and breath of love. Feel how this is not a story of God conquering the elements and forming a planet, but of love birthing a relationship that is meant to sustain life. This biblical account begins with earth in a sea of dark water, much like a womb, the primordial waters of the deep. In the beginning, when God created the universe, the earth was formless and desolate. The raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Earth exists from her very beginning as a formless embryo waiting to be born. The creator moves as a spirit like a midwife over the waters of this womb. In our scientific minds, we often don't think of the earth as being born, but this image of earth in a womb that the Genesis account gives us reminds us that earth is not a thing. It's not an it. It's a being. And if you hear nothing else from this message today, I would like you to hear this. Earth is not an it. Robin Wall Kimmerer, a Native American botanist who wrote the book Braiding Sweetgrass, encourages us to stop calling earth an it. Because when something is an it, it becomes easier to discount, to abuse, to defile, to use up. You can always tell the difference between people who treat animals like an it rather than a he or a she. It's always piddling on the floor. Sounds very different than she is always piddling on the floor. It is our home sounds very different than she is our home. This earth replica you hold in your hands, your home is a being, a living being who was birthed out of a womb of primordial waters through the amazing wisdom of our midwife God. And so I want to challenge us to change the way we talk about earth to change her pronoun from a nondescript it to a living and breathing and loving she. And see how this might change your perception of this blue planet we call home. On the third day in this new home, our earth, after separating the light from the darkness and the waters above from the waters below, Creator Spirit says, let the waters burst and the dry ground appear. Let the dry ground appear. In the biblical stories, appear is a very strong word. It's often used to describe the revelation of something sacred, like God or an angel or a star. 
So this appearance of dry land is a sacred moment, a revelation from the mysterious primordial womb. As this baby appears with its sacred dry land and the sacred womb of the sea, God then names the baby Earth. I could imagine God holding up this new planet as a proud parent would hold up any precious child and shouting to the cosmos, look, look at my new creation. I will call her Earth. After the birth and the naming of Earth, Creator Spirit animates Earth so that she can bring forth vegetation of every species. Each earth is transformed now into a living planet. The animation reveals a divine force. Earth has an innate spiritual impulse to reflect the energy of her creator, to bring forth life, to bring forth abundant life. Look at all the green parts of your little planet Earth. Think of all the billions of living organisms living on her. Think of all the moments of creation that happen every second of every day. Even her most violent moments, earthquakes and volcanoes, are really in response to creating a new land, new environments. Even in the face of death, Earth creates, huh? New arises out of everything that dies on this earth. Earth creates. That's what she does because she was birthed by a creator. Not a conqueror, a creator. And so in response to her creating midwife on the fifth and sixth days, the waters around earth and the sky above earth became filled with living creatures. Earth becomes a co-creator of life, the mother of all living. Now remember, this story was written for a people who were living in despair, far from home, displaced. Can you see how this story could comfort and challenge the hearers? To not only know that they were in a relationship with a God who had the power to create, but also that this God has given them a home no matter where they were. This earth is their home even while they are in captive lands. And earth keeps holding them in her arms, keeps creating despite their plight, and keeps the door open for them to find a new home. Robin Kimmerer urges those of us in the 21st century to also embrace this vision of Earth as home, as someone who opens her arms to us, but who also asks us to remember that she was created in, to be in relationship with all of her inhabitants. I'm intrigued by Robin's encouragement to stop talking about Earth as a resource, as an it as simply natural, natural resources, or minerals, or fuel resources, or water resources. Instead, she would like us to think of these as gifts given to us by Earth itself, herself. In all native cultures, it's common to thank Earth for whatever one takes for life. Even now in the 21st century, Inuits in Alaska talk about thanking the walrus or the whale or the caribou for the life they gave so that their people can eat. And I'm impressed by one of our young hunters from this church, who after he posts his photos of his most recent hunting kill on Instagram, always gives thanks to God for the animal. Always, he gives thanks to God. This is what Robin and other indigenous people the world over practice and urge us to practice with them. Look again at your little earth and think about 
all of the billions of organisms, the planets, the animals, the minerals, the water molecules. Think of all of that, that gives you life. Are you thankful to her for her abundance of gifts? Are you thankful to her for her open arms, which provide you with a place to call home? Norman Haybold, who's a biblical scholar, says, the focus of the narrative of Genesis 1 is on Earth, her origin, her birth, her animation, and her creation of living things. As Earth beings, it is time for us to celebrate the birth of our mother and find better ways of caring for her. Our role as co-creators with God and with Earth is to be in tune with the innate impulse of the Earth and to keep Earth alive. We are not here to conquer Earth, but to live in concert with Earth and Earth's creative impulse, and to be, above all else, thankful. Thankful that our God decided to birth a relationship with Earth and placed us as one of the pieces in this relationship, not as the pinnacle, but as the partner, as the partner with the whole, so that no matter what might happen in our lives, we will always have a home. We will always have a place, a place that we can always give thanks for, for all the gifts this earth gives us. Amen. We believe in the church given as a beacon for all nations. 
moved by the Spirit to serve all people. We believe that God will finally destroy the power of sin in us all, and that humanity will share God's everlasting life. We do not believe in the right of the strongest, nor in the force of arms, nor in the power of the oppressors. We want to believe in human rights, in the solidarity of all people, in the power of nonviolence. We do not believe in racism, wealth, privilege, or the established order. We want to believe that all men and women are equally human, that order based on violence and injustice is not order. We do not believe that we can ignore things which happen far away. We want to believe that the whole world is our home and that the field we plow and the harvest we reap belong to every person. We do not believe that we can fight oppression far away if we tolerate injustice here. We want to believe that there is but one right everywhere, that we are not free if one person remains enslaved. We do not believe that war and hunger are inevitable and peace unattainable. We want to believe in the beauty of simplicity, in love with open hands, in peace on earth. We do not believe that all suffering is in vain, nor that our dreams will remain dreams, nor that death is the end. But we dare to believe always and in spite of everything in a new humanity, in God's own dreams of a new heaven and a new earth, where justice will flourish. Amen. Once upon a time, God made a garden, and every creature lived in it happily with God. We took long walks with God in the cool of the evening, humans and snails and kangaroos and spiders, kitties and larks. And when we all sat down with God to eat, the curling vines gave up their fruit, the tall gold wheat gave up its grain, and we ate delicious bread and drank from a cup of blessing, singing songs under stars till morning, and the grateful creation was at peace. Ever since, when we honor the earth by eating and drinking with heartfelt thanks, God walks with us again. God sits with us and eats. Our tables become the garden, the whole creation sighs with peace, and we see again how life is meant to be. So come now, everyone, to this table, to the garden God planted in the east in Eden. Come, taste and remember, taste and see how good God is. Let us pray. Thank you, Creator God, for sharing your life with us in every good thing of this world. Thank you most of all for Jesus, who sat down to eat and drink good bread and good wine, so that in tasting how good they are, we could remember how good you are. Christ is our East, our Eden, our garden of peace. In Christ, we find the fullness of life you desired for us from the start walking together, sharing food, living in peace. Send the Spirit to this table now where Christ still sits down, where we still remember you. Bless the bread and the cup, the fruit of the earth and the work of our hands. May they become by your grace the taste of Eden in our hearts. And as we eat and drink together, let us see more clearly a vision of life as you meant it to be. Consecrate us to the ministry of making it so, by sharing earth's goodness with all, in reverence and hope, with justice and joy. Dear friends in Christ, this is the bread Jesus blessed and broke and gave to us to share in remembrance of him. <coughs> this is the fruit of the vine Jesus blessed and poured and gave us to drink in remembrance of him. Eating and drinking together, we remember his death. We rejoice in his rising, and we see Christ all around us as he comes to us daily. 
to judge in mercy, to welcome in love, and restore all creation to the praise and glory of God. Amen. Our loving God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now let us share in the meal as we take bread and eat, and take the fruit of the vine and eat. Let us sing together in blessing for the beauty.
speak the blessing one to another. May the joy of soaring birds be yours. May the peace of star-filled nights be yours. May the hope of sprouting seeds be yours. May the strength of flowing water rivers be yours. May God's love for all creation be yours. So that we can do all we can to remember that this earth is our home, our beloved home, given to us by a beloved God, for the glory of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Amen.